Time now to go into our second panel for today, and this one is working with your municipal partners, tactile responses to post-pandemic events. And it, it kind of leads off the back of uh, Rebecca's presentation and, and dealing with uh, three municipalities across the uh, province and on how they're dealing with working with their, with their council, how they're dealing with their uh, events and stuff in their area showcasing and highlighting a, a few of the different things that they have done throughout the pandemic to uh, to keep somewhat of our festival and events happening. I'd like to welcome Alison Monterey. She is the director, the recreation coordinator of events and community development and volunteers with the town of Caledon. Sarah Linfoot Fusen is the cultural project specialist at the city of Hamilton. She has led the Hamilton special events advisory team since 2014. And finally, Jeannie Maidens is the special events coordinator for the municipality of Port Hope. Welcome everybody, and I hope I got your names right. I'm, not, I'm terrible with names, so I apologize. Um, I'm gonna ask Allison to sort of lead us off and, and talk about the town of Caledon and, and what you guys have been doing and, and share with us some of your success stories and challenges that you've been working through through this pandemic. Allison? Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Allison. Um, as Dave has said, I work with the town of Caledon. I want to thank FEO, of course, for having me here this morning. Um, during the summer months, residents um, had been reaching out to the mayor's office and service Caledon and looking for some sort of concert drive-in because they were really desperate to get outside, do something, boost morale. So during the September 29th council meeting, there was a discussion as to if we should even be doing events during this time. Um, we were instructed by council to create a policy for event organizers so that all events in the town of Caledon could be done consistently and safe. And that's how this policy came to fruition. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So what we created was a policy called hosting events during a pandemic. Basically, the policy overview exists and all the slides and all the presentation will be shared at the end as well. Um, the town of Caledon supports and acknowledges that events are, of course, a very important part of everyday life and during challenging times, especially during the pandemic. Um, we wanted to make sure that things were done consistently and safely. Um, and what we did was we worked with, of course, Festival and Events Ontario and collectively working with the municipal, a network of municipal event planners. The scope was basically, um, it applies to all events being hosted in the town of Caledon, whether they're community events, corporate events, council events, or third party events. And it just made everybody accountable and making sure everybody was basically on the same page. We have guiding principles and actions for implementing safe events in Caledon. Um, we are to share this policy, of course, with staff, volunteer, partner, um, partnering organizations and stakeholders to make sure that the implement process is consistent. We are to seek compliance with federal and provincial uh, regional and municipal directives and legislation. Of course, build a relationship and contact Peel Public Health, specifically the director, to make sure that we're following the guidelines. It was really important to make sure that if restrictions can't be met, that we are to either cancel or um, defer to a different time, as we had to make sure we're responsible at all times. It was super important. Um, Super important to make sure that staff, volunteers, and partnering organizations and stakeholders all adhere to this specific policy. One thing that was a great course that I actually took was through the WHO, and it was to conduct risk assessments. And they gave great templates, and it is provided in the resources link on my presentation. It was important to develop, of course, cleaning standards and make sure that they're executed during and after the event. Arrange for pandemic training to make sure all staff are kept safe, as well as volunteers and event organizers. It was important to make sure that communication 
was really important, specifically with the public health directive, as well as OPP and fire. The OPP were key partners in many of the events that we facilitated. Develop crowd management and traffic flow plans. And I think Rebecca spoke to this, that having a plan in place was one of the most important things. Making sure that sanitize um, Asian products and to maintain personal hygiene were all available and to limit food service to prepackaged or takeout style. We then had to go to council with a report, which was approved to basically express to them um, how this was to keep everyone safe, making sure that staff and participants as part of the implementation, implementation process and the policy will be circulated with staff, volunteers, partnering organizations, stakeholders to host events, follow guiding principles, a uh, list of roles and responsibilities for all event organizers, and make recommendations to model Peel Public Health preventative practices during all events. Again, we talked about the OPP, fire, and Peel Public Health, and develop a community standard for hosting events. Again, so everything is done consistently, and an intent to build public confidence in the safe return of events, specifically with outdoor events, is pretty much that's all we were allowed. So these are a couple of things we did. We did some drive-in movies, concerts. Um, we did uh, the Bolton Italian Cultural Center wanted to do um, a concert that actually featured Elvis. It was super cool. We did have the same issue with people arriving um, either by foot or on bike. And we did just have to let them know that they had to kept, keep moving that at the time, Peel Public Health would not allow us to have anyone outside the vehicle. We did a ton of Santa drive-throughs over the holidays. Um, we did one in all of our different hamlets and in the different communities. Here's a little video. And there's Santa. <laughs> and here's just some more pictures of the event. And then we go into the mayor's levy. So typically we do a mayor's levy that's called Winterfest. And it's usually hosted at one of our recreation centers. And it includes swimming, skating, face painting, all the types of fun things you'd find around the holiday season. And of course, due to COVID-19, Winterfest 2021 was unable to take place in person. So what we did with the policy in place was we decided to do something curbside. And we did a Winterfest at home kit. And we included all the wonderful things that you would typically get at Winterfest, all packaged in a convenient reusable bag that was a shop local Caledon bag so that we could also incorporate the support for our community. The kit also includes a one-time pass for swimming and skating upon reopening. And that's all done through our Perfect Mind system for everybody that registered. Because of COVID-19, when people were welcomed back, in, back into the facility, we had to make sure that um, they book online. So this way the pass is already loaded on their account and they can use it. There were things like hand warmers for our outdoor skating rinks, hand sanitizers, scavenger hunts, cookie cutters, recipes, bookmarks, and the Calden Public Library provided books as well. So it was a great opportunity. And here's another little video.
And here's some more pictures. Here's actually um, Mayor Thompson and Councillor Nick DeBoer, who is giving out the kits curbside. People didn't even have to come in the rec center. Here's a little picture down in the corner of the operation and the little girl at the top is the first person to receive her kits. Here are the resources that I said are available and um, they'll be included with the slide presentation. And of course the core four for the region of Heal. So thank you very much, everyone, and I'll pass it on to Sarah. Thanks very much, uh, Allison. Uh, yeah, so uh, Sarah Linfoot, uh, if you could uh, take us away and, and update us on what was happening in the Hamilton area. Thanks, everyone, and uh, thanks, Theo, for inviting me today. Um, I'm going to pull up a presentation. Uh, let me just see if I can do this. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Sorry, I had it pulled up, but <laughs> disappeared. Oh, um, like everyone else, there were postponements and cancellations in Hamilton, um, which started in March, mid-March last year. Um, let's just go down to here. Started um, with over 50 people until April 6th, which extended uh, events that postponed their events to the fall, hoping that they, but as a result of the ongoing pandemic, many either had to modify or just had to cancel out right for 2020. Um, in Hamilton, cancellations were our emergency operations center. And overall, they were done really slowly and on a month by month basis because the emergency operations outright cancel all of our events for 2020 or even into the fall. They wanted to see how things were progressing as, as the year went. And our EOC also wanted event organizers um, to do the cancellations themselves. They didn't want to be heavy handed, have to cancel everything if they didn't need to. Um, later on in the year, we found that this, you know, posed some challenges, not only for us, but also for the event organizers, because a lot of event organizers really wanted some official guidance from the municipality and um, after July 3rd, we didn't cancel any events in 2020. So it became this kind of dance of um, whether events could happen based on provincial guidance and, uh, and the like. But by August, Hamilton was entertaining event requests again. And that was different from a lot of my other municipal colleagues. Um, when we had our meetings, I, I discovered that Hamilton was one of the um, rare municipalities that were actually allowing events to happen as long as they were under 100 people. And so from August to December, we had about 25 third party events that were able to happen in Hamilton. Um, and one of the examples I've put here on our slide was Arts Fest, which happens in Westdale BIA um, every year. Of course, for 2020, they had to modify their event. Their, they had a fenced in market area with one entry and one exit point, um, and also plexiglass barrier. Um, but it was great to see that uh, some events could, could pivot and, and still um, hold something in light of uh, the pandemic. With this, um, we discovered, you know, in August, as we were starting to entertain requests again, that we really needed some guidelines and we needed to help our event organizers um, sort of figure out how to And so we developed a reopening guideline that provided resources to event organizers based on the Provincial Reopening Ontario Act. And we updated them as the provincial framework changed over time. So there was some information given about what they could do, um, but also links to other resources. Okay. 
And then we also discovered that really what we needed from event organizers was for them to tell us um, how they were going to prevent the events. And so we uh, required uh, event organizers to submit a COVID-19 response plan, which was reviewed by public health. And they didn't approve plans, but they did review to see if there were any concerns or anything that event organizers need to, needed to augment for their events. And so it was really informal at first. And then we actually just, we, we developed a template for our 2021 season so that event organizers could use the template to submitting, you know, whatever that, whatever they had and a lot of back and forth with public health, we were able to um, get all of the information we needed. Um, and we also provided a lot of check boxes so that we, we were providing the information to them um, and they could say, yes, we're, we're planning to do this. It was helping with, I think, uh, generating ideas. Could do. This is a requirement now for 2021 for all of our events, major or community. And then the other piece that we added was to our, um, our application for 2021 is that we had some additional sign offs that we needed to include and this was um, in consultation with our legal department. Um, so we added some, you know, on the our seed application, some final authorizations that included verbiage about COVID and also, um, you know, asking event organizers to recognize that they've reviewed certain documents. So for 2021, um, we did a survey, our own survey. We wanted to test the waters and see if event organizers were intending to return, uh, if they were intending to modify or to cancel outright for 2021, just to have a good sense of, of what was going on. We had a 64% response rate, which I thought was great. Um, we asked event organizers whether or not their events would return in 2021 if there were still restrictions, and we used 100 people as the um, barometer. 45% uh, of respondents said no, they couldn't. 35% uh, said that they would do something modified, and 20, less than 20% said yes. So the number one reason given for those that said no was that gathering restrictions would be too restrictive for them. Um, other, re other reasons given were, you know, uh, the event wouldn't be financially viable, PPE was too costly, and it was also too costly to secure control a site um, to ensure that there was only a certain amount of people um, on site. Uh, modified events talked about changing their event formats to virtual or drive-through and restricting attendance or changing their event to a ticketed event um, and also staggering start and end times for their events. Hamilton, we weren't provided any, any direction in the fall. We didn't have any direction from our EOC or council about events moving forward for 2021. So we sent out um, an e-blast to our returning applicants in December and said, the application's available, um, please go on and apply. And, um, in the meantime, uh, now that we've done that, we've also gone forward to our EOC and asked them um, for permission to really encourage our event organizers to, to provide us with modifi modification options for 2021, but also we are planning to implement some timelines for submission so that we don't have last minute cancellations like we had last year that proved to be a challenge. Um, and also to help us with our planning processes. So that's going to our EOC tomorrow and hopefully we can share that with our event organizers after that point. That's it for me. <laughs> I've left my email address there if anyone wants to contact me and I know the presentations will be shared after. So over to Jeannie. <laughs> Sorry, I, I stepped out for a washer break. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Um, over now to uh, Jeannie Maidens. Um, Jeannie, what, what has the 
a municipality of uh, Port Hope been working on? and developing event proposals, keeping up to date with trends and legislation and supporting event organizers. And in my experience, detailed logistics and emergency planning have always been part of the job. Infection control measures and provincial gathering limit restrictions, not so much. And as we've seen in Hamilton and Caledon, the COVID policy response plan or the COVID safety plan, as we call it in Port Hope, is the new permitting piece for all of us, municipal event offices and festival organizers alike. So I want to share that I can appreciate the struggle and the juggle of this new requirement, balancing public safety and the event experience, your budget with a limited audience and new site design requirements, and having another layer added to the approval timeline. Throughout 2020, while Port Hope was in the green zone, I gained experience writing and reviewing COVID safety plans as we both permitted and produced a number of modified events. Cliche, yes, but necessity is the mother of invention. And although there were many event casualties in 2020, there were some really interesting innovations as well. And I'd love to dive into the topic of modifying the event experience maybe after in the Q&A. But for about the next five minutes, I just want to share a few reminders and recommendations for how to develop your event application and work with your municipal event office. I've opted to forego slides, so if you'll indulge me, um, I'll just start with a quick rundown of what the process is. So public events are permitted on municipal property through an application process. We know this. The process is in place to help ensure event planning is thorough and successful. It's in place to help mitigate any negative impacts to the community as well as manage liability. The application is the tool or system that communicates your request to the host municipality. It's what staff use to permit park and road use, ensure licensing requirements, prepare emergency services, allocate equipment, all the detailed coordination layers to ensure safe community engagement and a positive experience. I say all this because there's always been a requirement to ensure that licensing and regulations are being adhered to and that an event specific emergency plan is being developed. In today's new normal, the event application process now also requires planning to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in line with provincial guidelines and restrictions. And we know this too. And think of the COVID safety plan as extension of your emergency planning. In Port Hope's case, your plan is reviewed by the health unit and approved by the fire chief before your permit can be issued. But your plan, emergency and COVID safety, they're not just administrative requirements. They're tools for us and for you as event organizers to train your event teams and to clarify process and logistics to ensure event attendees, volunteers, and communities are kept safe. So you've heard some great tips already about how to develop the plan and the, the thinking behind the policy. And I'll just reiterate by saying, provide clear and succinct information that can be easy for municipal staff, public health officials, and your event teams to review a snapshot of your protocols. And remember that event staff and your health unit and police department and provincial resources are all available to assist you. Event planning, this, these, like these efforts, they matter and public safety matters and so does the success uh, and future return of events. The harsh reality is it might not be feasible for some events to adjust to the current requirements. It's a tough time. And I feel for my own community organizers and those across this province and beyond. And I just do want to remind you that municipalities love events, and so does the province for that matter. And they're celebrated traditions that contribute to cultural life in our communities. And as we move through this pandemic and the full return of events, you know, events will be instrumental in establishing vibrancy and connectivity of our neighborhoods again. And so with that in mind, I just wanna share a couple more general recommendations for how event organizers can prepare event plans, maybe for this year ahead. Monitor the provincial website for changes to the framework and updated requirements in your specific region. The regulations are driven by the evolution of the pandemic and they're subject to change. And we've been seeing that all along. And so even with this variable, 
Start your planning well in advance. Review your municipality's website to get a glimpse of their application intake status and internal process. But don't stop there. Get on the horn, pick up the phone, and make contact. As a festival organizer, you might have a long-standing relationship with your municipality, or maybe you're just starting out. Either way, it's important to make a personal connection with the permitting office. And this is advice you'll hear all throughout the summit. Relationships matter. And communication is key to ensure success and safety and compliance. And so through the process, expect a bit of back and forth, because it is a process. Explain your event vision, identify your questions, and know your limitations. The timeline for how event response framework will unfold this year is still unknown. And adaptability of event organizers, and this includes municipal staff, is essential. As mentioned, I facilitate permits, but I also plan events in Port Hope. And so coming from this place, I recommend having a few variations of your plan for the year ahead. A, B, C, contingency. Think about modifications such as virtual, hybrid, an event series, drive-in, self-guided activities, festival in a box, intimate activations, new partnerships, and so on. And to ensure brand or event continuity for this year, develop a program that can take place within the existing restriction landscape, and then consider a few realistic options for delivery in a different format if and when those restrictions change. Pivot as necessary could be a slogan for event organizers. Obviously moving from plan A to plan B to plan C comes with its own challenges, but with advanced and thoughtful planning, it could be done. It means putting in the work, drafting proposals, doing up the plans, filling out applications, and laying the groundwork for your achievable options. Set a decision-making timeline that helps you know when to drop the plan that's no longer feasible based on your countdown block. And as for municipal permitting staff, you know, we're responsible for assisting with outreach to our local health units, connecting with our special event advisory teams, our fire and police departments, and understanding the constraints and operational challenges of our permitting efforts. It's important for both sides, municipal staff and event organizers, to be realistic and honest about options for in-person events. It's important to be supportive and understand our different responsibilities. And the, the goal is to develop clear, achievable plans to maintain lines of communication between all stakeholders so we can pivot and deliver safe experiences in one form or another this year. And I'll share one final thought, I guess. So after you host your event in whatever format you're able to uh, within the landscape restrictions, connect back with your municipality to share your success, report back to council, share your media coverage with the marketing office. This detail is important, both because we're all in need of a good news story, but because it will help us solidify the process for the return of more events. And so I'll leave it there and open up for questions. Thanks very much, Jamie. And, and and we've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, first one is from Craig, Craig, and he's wondering, Sarah, if you'd be willing to share the results of your survey. He's interested in, in reading more about it. Um, I guess if that was something that's possible, you could get that link to Jay and he can make sure it's uploaded with the rest of our stuff. Will yep, that... I will, I'll do that. Uh, and the other, the other comment I want to make, and it sort of pertains to the three of you, and we had extended an invitation to the Durham region because Durham region's medical health actually put out a guide to special events in the pandemic. And they were one of the first health units I've seen actually produce a, a document on how they saw events coming back and happening. Interesting perspective because early, in the early days, it was really hard to get responses from the um, from the health team, obviously they're very busy and and they wanted information given up to them on how we perceived we could open. What's your experience has been like, uh, and Sarah, we can start with you maybe, in Hamilton and working with your municipal health department? Um, <laughs> I would, overall, my experience was really great with our public health. I would say that their perspective was because they're in public health, they see anything happening, no gatherings, but they appreciated the fact um, 
based on provincial guidelines, we could go forward with some smaller events. And so they were really good about collaborating with us and ensuring that these events. And so my experience was that, you know, we, I had one point of contact with our infectious diseases program. Um, and he was amazing at getting back to the event organizer they could do uh, to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, and again, it wasn't a, the, their plans weren't approved, but there was dialogue and communication. And so it allowed event organizers to go forward. Like I said, we had 25 events that happened um, between August and December that were on city property and permitted. So. Yeah, and dialogue is good because a lot of times, you know, we were submitting events and or for to the ministry at a provincial level, and we weren't hearing anything back. So, having dialogue municipality it, municipally is is great because uh, the Ministry of Health can come out with one set of guidelines that a municipality doesn't agree to it and can change them in the given area. Is that correct? Allison, what's your experience been in, in Caledon and working with public health throughout the pandemic? Um, part of my job is actually community development. So from the beginning of the pandemic, I sit on the community response table with the region of Peel. So I've had access um, directly to Dr. Brandon, Dr. Lawrence Lowe, as well as the director from Peel Public Health and her name is Louise Aubin. And right from day one, all I'd have to do is send her the ideas of what we were looking for, how we were doing it, whether police and fire were on board. And as long as I gave her the parameters, the policy and how we were moving forward, she was incredibly supportive. She would always send me back a formal email with all of her recommendations if there was anything that needed to be changed or added and it was fantastic. So I've been very much supported throughout the entire process. And Jeannie in Port Hope, how, how has the dialogue been with, uh, with the health department there? Yeah, similar, all parties. So the health unit, it's not just one, one stop, you know, the health unit, our emergency service providers, and as long as there's clear planning and the information is being shared, it's being reviewed and feedback is being provided. Um, there was certain flux throughout the year. Timelines need to be considered. You know, the volume of, of work for some of these departments increased substantially with other requirements um, as a result of the pandemic. So it's being realistic that the turnaround time is not going to be a day and, you know, building that understanding that it might take a little bit into the plan is important. Now, one of the things that, that that's going to happen is we're going to come out of this at some point and, and get back to whatever the new normal is going to be. Have you all started working on plans that integrate part of this pandemic event exposure? Because I'm sure a lot of the health restrictions, uh, you know, especially hand washing and cleanliness are going to be much more important with any standard moving forward. Have you started blending those in? Jeannie, we'll start with you. Yeah, so, you know, the event office is always trying to collect and present the requirements for event organizers to host events on public property. And these evolutions are being considered. And as new standards are being set, you will share those uh, with our organizers and through our event application process. So, uh, what exactly all of that looks like, what will be the legacy items that remain as an outcome of this pandemic. I think we're still in the middle of that and we'll see how it shakes out and whatever the new standards are, we certainly will incorporate that into our application process. And Sarah, is that similar to what you guys in Hamilton are working on as well? Yeah. Um, you know, we're all kind of taking baby steps, right, to try to work our terms of what we ask on our applications as well as um, work with our emergency operations center and also team that you know it's always been a we've had a public health representative to look at food safety well maybe it's now that we have somebody that disease you know moving forward that will be on our team so yeah like Jeannie we're we're working on it um, and and I do feel that um, for a long time and that it will be included in our in our review process. 
And Allison, how about uh, everyone up in the Caledon area? Yeah, we're working on the same thing. We're making sure that moving forward that safety precautions and things will still be in place. Anything that we are planning for 2021, I mean, we are hoping to be able to do some more things safely if things open up a little bit more. But just making sure that we're following new protocol and proper procedures. And I think for a while, keeping the communication and the dialogue open with the OPP and Peel Public Health, I think are going to be key measures to making sure that, you know, we continue to do things safely moving forward because, you know, we don't know how long this is going to be around. And we know that there's other viruses. I mean, the flu is down tremendously this year um, because of the precautions that we've put in place. So I think many of them will be really um, fantastic to keep around. Now, one of the things through this process I've learned, and it's been somewhat of a civics education or a snap to reality, um, and, and I heard it from a, a number of municipalities and I wasn't aware of it or, or didn't connect the dots, but uh, a lot of municipalities' events departments are driven off of their arena rentals or their swimming lessons and stuff like that. With all of that halted and postponed as well, has that had an impact on, in your municipality? Uh, and, and working with events or getting back into the event world? So I think so. I think there has been a lot of, of changes. And of course, a lot of our events incorporated things in the arena, like our Winterfest, for example, it incorporated swimming and skating during that event. So not having those resources available have made us have to pivot and adapt and put in more things. And also there's a budgetary uh, impact to that. Because if we're not being able to use the facilities and the resources that we have here, we're having to purchase additional resources. So there are lots of changes. We are in the budget process right now. And who knows what it'll look like. <laughs> we just have to hope moving forward that we're still able to do some things and, you know, utilize what we have. Because hosting the free events specifically um, do have a major budget impact. And without the funding coming in from the arenas and the pool that support those things, it has been a lot more challenging. How about you in Port Hope, Jeannie? Yeah, I'd say that any shortage of resource um, or venue has an impact uh, both on the deliverables that a municipality can provide for their you know, free community event experiences to the community, but as well as you know, an operating budget for the corporation. So they're are going to be impacts of this through all of these layers um, that may change what we're able to present or what we're able to offer as a venue to those looking to host an event within municipality of Port Hope. So yes, there is going to be an impact to a shortage of resources. What that looks like will depend on how the year unfolds and what event proposals come forward and see what we can offer uh, as a venue. And Allison, your perspective on that? Um, I think it's exactly the same. Uh, I think we're all struggling with the, the budgetary impacts. I will share that recently I've just been redeployed um, because again, we don't know what the future holds. And we do have another proposal going to council in March to try and plan for the rest of the year. But until we have any you know, solidified changes or zones changing or government restrictions, it, it's challenging. The other one I feel for, and it's a lot of the service clubs in your communities that, you know, they generate a lot of their revenue through these events that they run in the community. And, you know, service clubs have been hurting for memberships the last number of years. And I'm really afraid that a lot of people, a lot of them aren't going to come out of this. What, what's your been, your your sense dealing with those service clubs and and the revenue loss with them i've reached out to part of um at the beginning of the pandemic part of my project was to reach out to all of the 213 service clubs churches organizations within the community and i connected with them personally first i provided them a survey and then I verbally over the phone connected with each of them and many of the responses we received were that they don't know if they're going to survive. They don't know if they'll be around if this continues going on. And this was very early on in the pandemic. This was back, I want to say April, May. So now they have shared that there are many of them that won't be sustained 
sustainable and they won't be around. And that's really unfortunate for our community, let alone we've launched a huge shop local campaign, but as we know, small businesses, everyone in the area is really hurting at this point. So I do see a lot of gaps, uh, specifically in sponsorship as well. A lot of our events are based on sponsorship and with corporation, well, not corporations, but small businesses hurting, reaching out to them. Like they used to provide all sorts of freebies to our events and include things in our bags. And now they just can't. And that's really unfortunate. And it really does hurt everyone all the way around. We we're running out of time. We've only got two minutes left. And, and Angie, Angie has provided a question. Will municipalities be making permanent changes at facilities that will offer events to keep safety in place. As you mentioned, future virus and unknown impacts, such as water fountains, washroom facilities, to keep event goers as safe as possible. Are you maintaining venues in your area that do that for, for different events when they're back to the 50 or 100 people? Just We'll just do it really quick around the horn, Allison. Yes, absolutely. We are going to make sure moving forward, now that we've got a lot of these um, processes and protocols in place, Everything that we do moving forward, I think will be done because you never know when the next one is around the corner as well. And you want to make sure that you keep that level of standards. And I think it's really important for the community to see that it's being done because just because we reopen doesn't mean that people don't have fears or aren't concerned about, you know, their safety. And uh, Jeannie and Port Hope, same thing. Yeah, public safety is top of mind for us. So what what all those specifics will be going forward are probably still being defined at the moment, but certainly we will see evolution and changes. I, again, I'd like to thank Allison, Sarah, and Jeannie for joining us. Some great uh, information, some great documents to share with everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of our panel this morning. Thank you so Thanks. much for having Thanks, us. Thanks, everyone.